Now you're wild and free. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. All right. Um, dancing wheels, I'm just going to do an extension of that. Anybody that knows Seinfeld? Yeah. Um, I'm Elaine. <laughs> no, I'm not going to hurt your eyes. Um, I have three topics I'm going to talk to you about today. I know I'm the only thing between you and the airport, so um, I will keep us on schedule. Um, the first one being the title of this, which is Choices. Um, and I've heard a lot of us kind of uh, struggle with some of the comments that people made, uh, some of the uh, incidents that we're faced with, and sometimes it's very frustrating to have an invisible illness. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, the choices that we have there. Secondly, I'm part of a, a group called the Interna International Encephalitis Consortium. We couldn't think of a three-word three, three, uh, three word organization name that was any more full consonants. Um, so anyway, it's, uh, we just call it IEC for short. And um, some really exciting uh, a new report that's on its way out about uh, protocols and guidelines for rehabilitation post-acute encephalitis. It'll be the first of its kind. Um, it's in peer review right now among uh, the medical groups, and hopefully will be published in the fall. Um, and some really cool stuff, so I'm going to give you some preview of, of what's in that. And then lastly, um, just some practical tips of working with the medical teams, um, whether it's your neurologist, your internist, you know, all the other it's that you see um, that I've found to be helpful along the way. So. Uh, first, I would like to start with just asking, who has at least one of these residuals? Okay, keep your hand up if you have at least two, three, four, five, six. Okay, all right, all right. Trouble okay. reading them. My question is. Do these residuals make us less of a person? And I think that sometimes we internalize just because we've changed that somehow we are damaged goods. Um, this one to me really hit home because when I go to a grocery store, I see the entrance and the exit, and I don't know which one to choose. And I will play like I'm reviewing my receipt to make sure that they got it right. But really what I'm waiting for somebody to do is to exit the grocery store so I can follow them out. <laughs> because otherwise I get confused on the entrance exit thing. Um, so th I really thought that one was quite appropriate. Um, what I want to do is um, kind of challenge our thinking. Um, so I looked up at the word hiatus, which is a, a gap in processing very much similar to the gaps that we have in our own processing. Um, and I was thinking about the difference between me before and after encephalitis whenever I was looking at this word. I've tried to change the word um, encephalitis to accept my hiatus. <laughs> it's as close as I could get to rhyme. <laughs> but I'm tr I've really struggled the last few years to get over the anger and the frustration. I think um, I was probably just mad at the world the first few years, partly because it took so long for me to get diagnosed, but also just the change. And you know, some of the ways I've described it is, if you've ever had the pleasure to ride in um, the front of the, the airplane in the first class, you know what it's like, right? You know you're going to get the extra service, you know you're going to get the free drinks, you know that they're not going to, all the rules don't apply to you. So if you want to get up and go to the restroom even though the little seatbelt sign is on, then they're going to let you do it. So when you ride in coach, you realize, I don't get all that good stuff anymore. And that's kind of the way I've translated, and that was kind of the frustration that I went through. And so what I've been trying to get to is accepting my hiatus. <laughs> So I want to just kind of challenge our thinking with a few scenarios. And I know that most of these have happened because coincidentally, a lot of these came up in our survivor group yesterday. So let's just say you are in a group of people and you can't remember a word. It happens to me all the time. Um, do you, you have basically two choices. Um, are you defeated or are you challenged? And in my mind, most of the time in the past, I've I've felt defeated. You know, I'm damaged, I can't remember this word anymore. 
And what I've done lately, as I've accepted my hiatus, is especially in the business world, um, I've told my colleagues, and I've been quite blunt about you know my challenges, and I've told them aphasia, which is not for remembering a word, um, affects me probably more than, than most things. And so what I do now, instead of them trying to fill in the blank, because I'm sure like most of you, you, you pause and everybody wants to throw a word. And for me, it's like, you ever had a glass of water and there's a gnat in it? Yes. And you try to get the gnat out, and the more you try to get it, the more you're pushing it away. <laughs> that to me is what it's like when somebody tries to tell me what the word is I'm thinking. So in the business world, I, hand, I hold up my hand, and they know that means silence. <laughs> Just give me a motion, you know, a moment, and let me challenge myself of trying to come up with a word. And if I put my hand down, then they can just fill in the blank and they're all screaming it out. <laughs> but until I put my hand down, that means I'm, I'm trying to challenge myself instead of feeling defeated. <clears throat> all right, I heard Dave say this yesterday. You know, he goes outside, can't remember why, he goes back in. Oh yeah, he goes back outside. Oh, now I forgot again. And I'm sure this happens to all of us. I go to the kitchen a lot. I work it out of my home when I'm not traveling. And when I go to the kitchen, I'll just stand in there and I'm like, okay, and often my husband Gary will be sitting in the, his, uh, at the table and he'll look at me and he won't say anything because he knows that I'll walk away and three minutes later I'll be back. <laughs> um, but, you know, for me, I have uh, what you call an overcritical ego. We all have uh, two, two egos that we're born with. One is critical, one is nurturing. And when you have an overactive critical ego, then the tendency is going to be, you know, gosh darn it, why can't I remember why I was doing that? And it's important to kind of catch your own thinking so that you're not overplaying the critical nature because that just defeats you more, right? And so I try to laugh at myself now. I try to go in for that third or fourth time to the kitchen and just go, oh wow, okay, well, at least I'm getting some exercise. <laughs> Next scenario, um, somebody asks uh, how long ago you had E and you can't do the math. Uh, this actually came up yesterday and I know a lot of us were trying to you know, find fingers to count on and everything. Um, you know, your options, you can curse encephalitis and you know, why did this happen to me? Um, something that I did two years ago was I took an online training course called Cogmed. It's very similar to Lum uh, Lumosity. Did I get that right? Um, I don't. I've not taken Lumosity, so I'm not um, endorsing one or the other. I'm just telling you what I'm exposed to. It's Cogmed, and it was really, really tough. But one of the goals that I had was improving my math skills. And if you know about math, part of the reason that we struggle with that is our memory. Because if somebody says add 45 and 92, you're struggling with, okay, line up the, I don't even know what I said now, 45 and 92. 92. So you're trying to add this other column and then remember that number. And then, so it's not that we're necessarily bad at math, it's the memory issues that prevent us from holding the numbers long enough. So when I took Cogmed, so it you was- have a quick question on those programs. Yes. By the way, 137. But <laughs> that I could still do. Some of them have this horrible timer, just drives me crazy. So I can't do them because of timing. How long it takes me to do the question? I get so frustrated because I'm never going to be able to do it as fast as they want me to do it. So that makes me feel like a total failure because I know it's going to take me longer than they go. Like you get an A if you're. 15 right. seconds, you get a C if you're 30 seconds. I know I'm going to be this long to get there. So I just, I tried exactly. I think they'd be good, but that particular aspect of them just, I can't get past. So does Cognet help? Does it time you? So Cognet, and I'm trying to remember some of the exercises, most of them were not timed. Oh, that's good. They were, it would give you, let's just say there's six squares. Um, and they light up, let's say, three squares of the six. And you have to remember the order. And what it does is it shows you the pattern. Let's just say, you know, it's one, two, three. Yes. And 
then the pattern goes away, and then you hit start when you're ready to start. And you can process it in your mind, and then you, you do one, two, three, or you know, whatever. But you have as much time as you want. Um, and it'll, it gives you results in terms of how long it's taking you, or um, like your overall assessment. How many times you're getting a sequence in a row. Um, and it'll also pause you if you get three things wrong in a row, it'll just tell you to pause and take a break and just go do something else and then come back when you're ready because you're overtaxed. For me, I would take, most of the sessions took about 45 minutes and afterwards, literally, I mean, I would just have to take a nap. <laughs> it was just exhausting. But before I did this, I had the same um, conference code and, and password for my conference bridge at work and I had a cheat sheet that I carried with me everywhere. Um, and now I can do it all from memory. And it's, a lot of it's based on patterns, a lot of it's just based on um, how you retrain your brain. The neuroplasticity definitely comes into effect here. But I've changed the way I, I memorize numbers now, and so I memorize them in patterns, much like a phone, right? Instead of just, oh my gosh, this is overwhelming, they just gave me eight eight numbers and I have to remember them, you know. Now it's, okay, just sequence and, uh, and, and it's different for everyone. But uh, that made a huge difference for me. It's a, it's a time investment more than anything. But um, one of my doctors uh, set me up on it and um, I'm quite grateful. Any other questions? All right. Um, scenario C, someone says, well, you look fine to me. Yes. So, who chooses anger? <laughs> who chooses educate? The real answer is slap them in the face. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one has really been um, one of the more challenging things to me is when people say, well, you know, you're the same Becky I knew a long time ago. And what they don't see are all the medications that I take that I can't sleep, um, I have to you know, over medicate just to try to fall asleep at night, um, and all the things, and so I used to get really frustrated by it and feel offended, and that was where I chose to be, and I, I you know, contained all that anger in that one, and I was almost like daring them to say it, because I wanted to be mad. Um, but now I really try to take the opportunity to educate and to say, well, you know, if you've ever met somebody that's had a stroke, it's very similar to that. You can't see all the issues that they have. Um, some of us do have mobil mobility issues that are going to be a little bit more apparent, or we may have a speech issue that might be more apparent, but a lot of the things are very invisible. <coughs> and so um, now I try to educate. It still doesn't mean that I'm not just you know, a tinge angry, yeah. but I, I try to really use it as an opportunity for education. All right, scenario D. E. Where am I clicking? Here we go. Um, you're in a loud restaurant and you can't hear yourself think. Um, this is another one of those things that I worked really hard at trying to change things. For the first probably five to six years, it's been eight, a little over eight years since I had the onset, um, I would force myself to be as normal and as much like my old self as possible. So, and especially in business situations, uh, I was brand new in my job whenever I got sick, and I felt like it was my responsibility to be as much like me as possible. So I would challenge myself, I'd go to these dinners and these really loud restaurants, and what I would find myself doing is just being, sitting there just like a recluse. And there were things going on all around me, but I wasn't really paying attention to the conversation. And when I knew something was directed at me, I would nod and I would say it over and over and over again and then I would run to the restroom and I would write it down because <laughs> I was too embarrassed to let anybody know about my memory shortcomings. Uh. And so now I carry a notebook with me. I choose, um, I purposely choose restaurants that are going to be, uh, that have carpet where it's not really loud or an environment where I know that we can kind of tuck away in a corner. And again, these are choices, right? We can either sit there and suffer and be frustrated and not be able to be part of the conversation, or we can speak up and say, hey, you know what? It would really be more optimal if we can go over here. And I've done this with some friends lately, 
and I've just said, you know, the vertigo is horrible. This restaurant's going to be really bad. I know you've been dying to go to this restaurant, but can we please go to this one instead until I feel better? So um, again, just I feel like we have choices, and sometimes we might not realize how apparent it is, and that people really want what's best for you. I mean, they they may enjoy a certain restaurant, but they don't want you to be miserable. So I don't know. I just um, using my own experience. Um, <clears throat> before I move on to the next session uh, section of it, uh, think about I guess in the first few years when I identified with myself, it was I'm Becky. I you know I had encephalitis, and and I'm broken or I'm damaged or whatever. Um, that's not really the case. I'm still Becky. I may be a different version of who I was before. I actually kind of like this version better. A little bit more laid back. I don't sweat the small stuff as much. Uh, certainly put family at a much more, you know, bigger priority. I used to work every weekend and every night and now uh, make different choices. Um, and so I would just challenge, you know, are you you still? Or do you want to be an encephalitis survivor and that is your only identity and I think some of us get stuck in that and I would just again challenge you and, and say it's a choice of how you look at yourself um, I didn't know any of you before encephalitis and you didn't know me before encephalitis but I like everybody the way they are here Thank you. <laughs> Amen. so for me I made a list of the things that I like better about myself if you're stuck in that, well, my only identity is encephalitis versus who I am today, you might make a list of, of what you like about yourself that's different. Um, I really do like the way minions laugh. It doesn't really have anything to do with me. <laughs> but I thought it was a cute picture. Um, so one thing that I found, I'd always wanted to do something in nonprofit. I never knew what it was. People would say, well, what are you most passionate about? I'm like, well, I like cats. You know, they, they ask, do you like kids? Oh, of course I like kids. Well, do you like to be around people that have challenges? Sure, you know, but I couldn't pick a place. And it almost seems like a divine intervention that, you know, this has been a challenge in my life because now I know what I want to do and I just want to help others. And it's been great to be part of this organization. Thanks for letting me speak a third time. I'm sure y'all can. Uh, third time's a charm. <laughs> third time's a charm, cool. Anyway, it, it, it's uh, also deep in my faith. I had really been mad at God for a long time for other things that happened in my life. And this just brought me back to my foundation. And so it's, it's really actually had a lot of benefits. So I'm gonna switch gears. Um, a few of you raised your hand in the survivor session this morning that, um, that you found a doctor that you really, really like. Some of you have not found that person yet. I can tell you after eight years, it took me um, this long to finally find a neurologist that I really like. I found her two months ago, and um, it has been life-changing, seriously, because she has really validated a lot of the issues that I was facing. I was fought vertigo the last three years. Anybody that met me the last two years at a conference, and I was kind of uh, probably not very personable, it was because I absolutely felt horrible. And um, I was just doing my best to show up and, and be cordial, um, but now, I've uh, got a new medication that has finally put that into place. And finding those right doctors can make you feel validated, understood, et cetera. So if you haven't found the one for you, fire your doctor, keep trying, find the one that, that makes you feel right and that uh, has your best interest. So this is gonna kind of transition to the consortium, the IEC that I'm part of. We have uh, basically around 85 doctors around the globe. These are primarily neurologists and epidemiologists. Um, if you don't know what an epidemiologist is, these are the more scientific focused guys. They really wanna focus on uh, what the causes of different things are. Dale, you could probably do a much better job of describing what that role is. Uh, but I'll just keep it in layman's terms. Uh, but these guys are very passionate about encephalitis and not many of them actually see patients per se because they are more on the uh, educational side um, or they work for the government. Uh, there's a lot of members that are part of the CDC. 
So they're really looking for how to prevent um, big things like Zika from coming to the states, or they're analyzing West Nile so that it's not a continued problem. Uh, the, the issue with, with West Nile, and I'll just give this little two cents because I have been really frustrated that uh, you can get a vaccination for a horse with, yes. uh, for West Nile, but not for people. And I called a CDC person really frustrated and ready to just you know, head, go head to head with them. And I got so educated and humbled after that phone call. Um, the reason we don't have that is because the West Nile is, is based on the host is the bird. And you, don't, you cannot predict where the birds are going to go from year to year. And in order to trap enough of these birds and get the serum and the, and the mosquitoes, um, you have to be able to know where they're going to be. Well, Texas has been hit pretty hard. Florida's been hit pretty hard. They could put a team on the ground, but they don't know for sure where it's going to be. So that's why it's harder to uh, get enough of the serum in order to pr uh, produce a vaccination. So that's the best way I can say that. But anyway, the IEC has several different focus areas. We call them working groups. The second one is one that I've been actively part of for the last two years. And this is the, the research that we're about to produce that I'm very excited to talk to you about. So I would suggest, I, I could read this slide, but if you want to just take it in for a moment. There's uh, several different areas that it's going to be focusing on. Um, again, it's the first thing that's going to really focus on the post-acute phase of how to address the illness. Uh, it's got what it's called a rehabilitation toolkit, which will include all the different therapies and treatments. Of, uh, if any of you met Bob Morris over the last couple of days, he's had more therapy than anyone I know, any sur single survivor that I've ever known, and it will include a lot of these different aspects of things that are available that maybe most doctors are not aware of in order to prescribe. Um, it includes speech, uh, behavioral, uh, occupational therapy. I mean, any type of therapy you can imagine will go into this toolkit as uh, simple. Yeah, um, and another good aspect of this is that if it's documented and you know it's proven that these are, are gonna improve the lives, then this should help on the insurance angle to where it's more acceptable. And I know most people in the United States have a really big issue with this because it's not treated as a brain injury. Um, which is my last point is it emphasizes throughout the entire report that encephalitis is just another form of brain injury. It's you know very similar to TBI and to stroke. And so um, if we can relate it to that, then I think that that is a huge stride for all of us. So related to that, the other agency that has that same problem is the uh, military. So the military has ABI and TBI in completely different pockets. So they are doing all this research on ABI, which is good. You know, they're men who have men, usually men and women who've been subject to bomb blasts and such. Yeah. But uh, uh, so the acquired that's the TBI. So acquired variant injuries they won't put together and. A lot of the research should, it relates the two things together. So I think the Army, particularly, if you're doing this kind of thing as mm -hmm. a group, you could attack the armies as well, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> it's, there's some good things coming out. I, it looks like we're finally getting a lot more recognition and awareness. It doesn't feel like it to us, I know. But there are things happening, which is why I wanted to highlight this today, is just to say, there are doctors who care. There are doctors who specialize in it. I know they're not at every place. I think I looked up online. There are, I think, close to 18,000 neurologists in the entire U.S. And encephalitis occurs in 20,000 patients in the U.S. per year. And so most doctors will have never seen this before. You know, especially if somebody's well known for encephalitis, those patients are going to tend to flock to them, which means. These other guys have never been, you know, they've never seen it. They studied it for maybe two hours in med school um, and then never saw it again. Another aspect of this uh, consortium is there are a couple of neurologists that are willing to bring uh, survivors as spokespeople at uh, universities. Uh, Bob just did one of these at Brown University where there was a one hour lecture on encephalitis and in the second hour, 
um, one of the doctors interviewed him on stage, and so the patient, the patients had, or not the patients, the uh, students had tons of questions, and it, you know, this is going to be more memorable to them that they actually talk to a survivor versus just hearing about it in a textbook. So, you know, again, some good stuff happening. This is we're in a kind of a trial phase of that right now, but um, hopefully that'll become more of a standard. I used candy because this is just candy to me of all the stuff that's in this. Um, but it, it does, have, you know, to Dale's point, it's highlighting some of the post-encephalitis syndromes. Um, a lot of us have PTSD because of just the shock to the system. And if you didn't get proper um, support afterwards, it can be a post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, obviously, anxiety, memory disorders go on with that. Um, and the last thing I wanted to emphasize around the, the report is it's the only thing I've seen that really talks about the impact to the caregivers as well. And so I think that that is a very important aspect. And if I could ask anybody um, who is a caregiver to stand for a moment. I just want to say we applaud you for your sacrifices, <laughs> for your time, for your patience, for your sense of humor, for everything you do to make our lives as normal as possible. We know that you have gone through tons of research to understand what the doctors are saying, to translate it back to us so that we can understand it. And for that, I, I would like for everybody that's a survivor to applaud you. Uh, 
I kind of scratched my head. I was like, uh, well, I have the residuals from encephalitis. And I said, no, no, you don't understand. Encephalitis is swelling the brain. That's what you had during the acute phase. You don't have it anymore. And I said, yes, but I still have the residuals that were the impact of that. And they continued to try to explain to me that I didn't have it. And I just said, okay. So I said, forget that. What if I'd had a stroke? And I was telling you these symptoms. And she said, oh, well, then I'd give you this medication and this, and we try this therapy. And so, you know, that just told me a lot that I need to check and see how um, much exposure these doctors have had to encephalitis before you go sign up and have this six-month wishful thinking that you're going to get all your answers. Mm -hmm. um, summarizing your medical history, uh, I think that's a pretty easy one, but just... I carry it in my purse. I have everything that I've ever um, had. I have all my medications written down. Um, you're going to be asked these things over and over again anyway, so it's nice to have a little handy cheat sheet with you. Um, I think conducting your own research is very important, but I'd say be just very cautious to uh, try to self-diagnose. You know, a lot of times we can see something and say, oh, yeah, I've got all five of these things. Um, that must be it. And, you know, it's, I think, in the age of Google, it's easy to find something that matches up, but let the doctors be the doctor, even if we don't trust them all the time. <laughs> Dr. Google. <laughs> right. One other thing I do is I send a one-page letter uh, before any new doctor appointment. And what I do is tell them who I am and what the circumstances are and what I'm hoping to achieve out of the appointment. And I fax it to them about two to three days in advance. I find out who the stakeholder is so that they know who I am and they actually give it to the doctor. And nine times out of ten, the doctor's already read it. And it's like, oh, you're the one that sent the letter. And so they're already thinking about you before you even arrive. <laughs> and you're more likely going to get a better outcome from your, your appointment because they've thought about it. Um, most of them have, you know, they're looking at the clock because... They're not going to get paid unless they're turning six you know, patients every six to ten minutes. And so, you know, that also makes that time efficient for them if they're already thinking about you in advance. Um, I always take notes during the appointment. Um, if you don't, I would highly recommend that. I keep a notebook and I write down everything. And if I don't understand what they're talking about, or if they say a word that I don't know what it means, then I pause them and I say, hey, I'm not familiar with that. Can you please explain it? And they'll spell it for me so that I can look it up later on Google um, as I'm playing Dr. Google. So that was before the appointment. At the appointment, um, I love jeans. This is me. I feel best in them. Um, I just, as soon as I get home from a work meeting, my jeans go back on. But if I'm going to a doctor that I'm not established patient with, and they don't know me from Adam, then what I do is I wear a business suit. And I make myself look as important as possible. So, and they treat you differently. And it shouldn't be that way, but it is. So if you go in with sweatpants on, feeling all comfortable, they're going to look at you as you know somebody that likes to hang out and sit on the couch and you know chill out on the weekend. Versus somebody that is taking a lot of pride in themselves and is there, and their time is just as important as the doctor's. Mm -hmm. um, so I highly recommend that. I have gotten treated very differently. I've uh, tested it out, and I've, I've done the jeans thing instead of the dress-up thing, just to see uh, with new doctors, and it is not a day difference. So uh, just one other thing that I learned. Becky, yes. along that line, I have found also as when I go dressed in jeans as opposed to dressed in better clothes, my response from the doctor is different. Yeah, it's, um, I guess it's a perception thing. Yeah. But it, it's, um, I'm glad that you're seeing the same thing. Becky, I yes. think it's the initial, uh, you're saying it's the initial, right? I'm saying until you're established. Yeah, because. I used to go in my pajamas because we were living in the hospital. But <clears throat> after they met me the first time, they would warn the next rotation of doctors prior to getting there because I wouldn't even have pen and paper. But I, as I told them all, 
You need to know the chart, not the summary, because I know the chart. So I would go in my pajamas because it would be early in the morning. But because after the initial meeting me, they knew that you need to do your research. Do not waste my time ever. <laughs> this is very important. Yeah. And I, t I would tell them before I had, when I schedule new meetings with neuropsychologists and psychologists and anybody, you need to read some information because my daughter has NMDA, autoimmune encephalitis. She's nine now. Onset was at six. Prior to me getting there, we need to read some information because you don't want to waste my time and I show up. Good for you. Yeah, so, I, yeah. I think we have to take ourselves as, as serious as the doctor that's seeing us. So it's a great point. Um, another thing that I encourage is we are not, we have a rare illness, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and like I said, there's 18,000 neurologists in the U.S. There's 20,000 of us. They don't, you know, not all of them have seen this. And it's easy for us to get frustrated. Um, I've learned that when I get emotional, not just, you know, sad is okay. I mean, if you're, you're disappointed and you're sad and what you're hearing, it's one thing. But to get angry at them or to um, kind of just cast them all in one bucket of, you know, y'all don't know anything, all it does is make it divisive. And, um, and at that point, I think we lose. Mm -hmm. So I would just encourage, you know, to the extent possible, keep you know the emotions in check. Um, like I said a minute ago, when I give them that uh, symptom tracker, I just stop talking and I just let them absorb the information. Silence is huge whenever you're talking to a doctor because they're going to take it a little bit more seriously as they absorb all that information. Um, <laughs> I'm in your job to trust your gut. Um, I think that we've all been there when they've said, you know, I'm sorry, nothing's wrong with you. Um, when I had all the vertigo issues, I went to the most qualified doctor I could find in the Dallas area, and I told them about, you know, I'm fine when I wake up, but as soon as I start using my eyes or start to turn my head, I get dizzy, and um, he listened to me and asked a few questions, and then he said, you need to breathe into a paper bag when you have these situations. <laughs> it's like, okay, I knew it wasn't stress, and I knew that he was wrong. Um, I just had to accept that and go, this guy doesn't know. But I didn't stop there, you know, you have to just keep looking. Um, but uh, you know that there's something wrong, and you, you know your body better than anybody else. So, you know, resist the temptation of making it, or letting a doctor make you feel like you're crazy. You're not crazy. Uh, or it says, you know, ask questions, seek to understand. If there's a word that they're using that you don't know, tell them to spell it, you know, write it down, whatever. Um, there's one medication that I've had that uh, actually brought all of my onset symptoms back. And uh, Dale was a help to me while I was in the hospital. This was in 2012. I just had a hip replacement. And I was given a drug called Tawin. It's a very unusual pain medication uh, that should never be administered to somebody that's had a brain injury. So it's, again, important for them to understand your, your history, even if you're not being treated for something related to encephalitis. Obviously, the hip was not anything to do with the brain, um, but they gave me this medication and it brought back a lot of the symptoms and that's when all the vertigo started. So um, be sure to, to make sure that they understand what medications you should should, should not be given. How do you spell that? Talon is T-A-L, I think it's T-A-L-W-I-N. That's correct. Got it right. <laughs> 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 So I remember being in the hospital telling my sister, I feel like I have encephalitis all over again. And I had to hold my ears. The hospital had to turn the lights off in my room. Uh, Gary can tell you that I was absolutely unbearable to be around. Um, I was just, I didn't want anyone to be around me. It was just, just horrible. Uh, so anyway, uh, just to end, um, I too have been uh, an author, wrote about my experience called Brain Wreck. Um, I didn't bring copies of the book, but if you're interested, you can check it out. Um, I do maintain a blog. I host meetings in Dallas for survivors. 
uh, not so much this past year because I just didn't feel good. Um, but in the last years, so I've held three to four a year. Um, English come down for a couple of those. And what I do is I collect tips very similar to what we talked about in our survivor sessions around medications that help with either seizures or headaches or you know whatever. And then I'll, every time I do a, a session, I will capture this information and put it out on my blog. So the blog is um, bdbrainwreck.com if you're wanting to find some tips that I just talked about in, in terms of appointments or you know things that I've collected from other survivors. So in closing, <coughs> attitude is everything. It's, we really have a lot of choices around how we interpret our condition. And so do we, do we want it to be a horrible thing that we live with for the rest of our lives? Or do we embrace it and say, okay, there are challenges, but I'm gonna move ahead. And there's things I really, really like about myself now. And I think that that's one of the things that I struggle with, but it's, uh, it, it, I think I've come a long way in just the way I interpret that data. Um, brain plasticity, I know that Nicholas talked about it a lot. Uh, Dale talked about it some. Um, through that program that I was talking about, Cognmed, that was the most visible change that I saw in, in terms of improvement. And um, I, every time I'm here, I, this is my fifth year to be here, and everyone that I met the first year, I see them year after year, and it's amazing how much improvement. Um, so all of us are improving over time. It's, it's great to see that. Um, and that's, uh, that's it. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer anything. Otherwise, I know your planes are eager eagerly awaiting you. Questions, comments? Thanks, Joe. No questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs>